فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم section interrupting the recitation the author here rahimahullah he talks about things that can interrupt the recitation of the reciter نعم if the reciter passes by a group of people while he's reciting, it is recommended that he interrupt his recitation, group them, and then continue with his recitation. If a person is reading and a group of people walk by you, okay, it is recommended that the person disconnects his recitation and he greets those people, then he should go back to his recitation. And if he does go back, he should say, A'udhu Billahi. It would be better to do that. If the one reciting is seated and passed by others, Imam Abu Hassan al Wahidi's opinion is that it is better not to greet the reciter as he is busy reciting, and that if he is greeted, it is enough for him to gesture, to gesture in response. And, and Imam Abu Hassan al Wahidi, he says, Al Aula Tarku Salami al Al Qari. If you see a person reading the Quran, it's better that you leave them alone. Don't read, don't say Salam Alikul. Lishtigali bi tilawa. Because this individual is busy with the recitation. فَإِنْ سَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِ إِنْسَانٌ كَفَاهُ الرَّدُّ بِالْإِشَارَةِ And if somebody gives him salams, the one who is reading, he doesn't have to respond, he can just do this. And just show his, uh, give a gesture, a hand movement in response to that greeting. No. He is also of the opinion that if the reciter desires to respond verbally, then he may do so and then continue with his recitation after seeking refuge from shaitan. This, however, is a weak opinion, as the evidence clearly suggests that it is mandatory to verbally return a greeting. This is based on the premise that if the reciter walks into a mosque during a Friday sermon and gives his salam, it is still obligatory to respond, according to the more correct of the two scholarly opinions. So if Nawi rahimahullah holds the opinion that if a person comes into the masjid on the day of Jum'ah, while the khutbah is going on, and he says, Assalamu alaikum, that the people should respond to him based on the ayah وَإِذَا حُيِّيْتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا That the responding to the uh, salams is an exception here. It has to be done. So the statement of Al-Wa'idi which is كَفَاهُ الرَّدْ بِالْإِشَارَةِ That a gesture is enough. No, he doesn't like the idea. How can it just be a gesture? He has to respond and he has to give an answer in return to, to that. No. If then it is obligatory to return the salam during the sermon, and keeping in mind that there are different opinions regarding the permissibility of speech during the sermon, it would be more deserving to return the salam while reciting, as according to the consensus of the scholars, speech is permissible during recitation. In addition to this, returning the salam is at a general level mandatory and Allah's best. So he talks about the issue of even if some say that Jum'ah it's not permissible to do salams. Then he said, this is a specification for that time only, maybe. That could be an argument. But the statement of, what's his name? Uh, Imam Abu Hassan Al-Wahidi, where he says that, kafahu al bil ishara that's not correct. Because the response of the salams verbally is obligatory generally. Okay, maybe not necessarily on the day of Jum'ah, there's a khilaf regarding that. But any other situation other than that, it's obligatory. Now. Should the reciter sneeze while reciting, it is recommended that he say Alhamdulillah. Likewise, when someone else sneezes, the reciter should say Alhamdulillah, as long as he, the reciter, is not in prayer. No. When the reciter hears the call to prayers, he should stop his recitation, repeat the words of the Adhan and Iqama, and then go back to reciting. So if the Adhan is going off, the person should stop the recitation and go to and listen to the adhan and go back to the recitation of the Quran. Now, this is something our companions have agreed upon. If something is requested from the reciter while he is reciting and he is able to respond to the person demanding it with comprehensible gestures and without upsetting him or doing harm to their relationship, then it is best to do so and hence not interrupt his recitation. It is nonetheless permissible to stop the recitation in order to respond verbally and Allah knows best. Now, section. It is acceptable to stand up in honor of a person deserving of special respect, such as a scholar or a person known for their righteousness. Here he talks about the issue of standing up for somebody. Now, 
So if a person who's virtuous in terms of knowledge or righteousness and his piety, then standing up for him, permissibility has come regarding his head. Mm -hmm. So is it acceptable to stand up in honor of a person deserving of special respect, such as a scholar or a person known for their righteousness or honor, or an elderly person or someone deserving of respect due to their guardianship or kinship, provided it is feigned for the sake of being admired and provided it doesn't entail glorification this beyond acceptable limits? So a riya, showing off, an i'dam, where you basically grow, grow, it shouldn't be because showing off, you shouldn't be doing that to show off. And you shouldn't also be standing up for this person to glorify them beyond the uh, set limits. If you're doing it, uh, going extreme in it, then this, in this regard is incorrect. No. Indeed, as long as one's intention is sincere to show respect in such instances is recommended. Proof of the acceptability of what we've just mentioned may be taken from the actions of the Prophet وسلم, and the actions of his companions. Mm -hmm. The actions of the pious predecessors as well as the generation that followed after them and the actions of scholars and those renowned for their righteousness and piety. This is action that the Prophet did, the companions did and But this is not unrestricted. It shouldn't be something that's done generally that you stand up for everybody. You should. The athar and the textual evidences have to be really looked at. The Prophet ﷺ, there would be seen him standing up or somebody standing up for the Prophet ﷺ, or the Sahaba standing up for one another if the person came from a what? A travel, for example, and you haven't seen them for a long time. The na'am is, is permissible now. But if we see each other every single day, then there's no significance in getting up for that person. Because when the Prophet ﷺ, he prohibited the companions to stand up for him. He وسلم, he prohibited them standing up for him. So we need to reconcile between the evidences. And also nowadays what you find is that it's common and it's something we do generally speaking, which is um, there are many virtues that are connected to shaking a person's hand. And a lot of the times what you find is that people standing up for each other, hugging each other. And so they hug and they don't even shake each other's hands. When the virtue is connected to the shaking of the hands. And it's funny because nowadays even the shaking, even the hugging is not full hugging. It's just he smacks his shoulder against your shoulder. So, that's what, that's what it is. So whoever's got a broader shoulder, who spent more time in the gym, you know, it doesn't get hurt. The other one does, right? So, now it's, 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 it's knowing that the vir which one has the virtue, which is the salams. Now. Indeed, I have managed to compile a piece regarding the rulings on standing up for others and have mentioned it within it in prophetic traditions as well as reports from companions and the predecessors that clarify that which is recommended and that which is prohibited on this issue. I have also pointed out the weak narrations from the authentic ones and provided responses to alleged prohibitions on this matter that aren't really prohibitions at all. All these issues I've managed to clarify by the grace of Allah and anyone with doubts and concerns regarding that which has been reported should read this piece as it will eradicate any doubts that may exist, Allah willing. Faslun fi ahkamin nafisatin تتعلق بالقراءة في الصلاة أبالغ في اختصارها فإنها مشهورة في كتب الفقه منها أنه تجب القراءة في الصلاة المفروضة بإجماع العلماء ثم قال مالك والشافعي وأحمد رحمهم الله تعالى وجماهير العلماء تتعين قراءة الفاتحة في كل ركعة وقال أبو حنيفة رضي الله عنه وجماعة لا تتعين الفاتحة أبدا قال ولا تجب القراءة في الركعتين الأخريين والصواب الأول فقد تظاهرت عليه الأدلة من السنة ويكفي من ذلك قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث الصحيح لا تجزئ صلاة لا يقرأ فيها بأم القرآن واجمعوا على استحباب قراءة, قراءة السور بعد الفاتحة في ركعتي الصبح والأوليين من باقي الصلوات واختلفوا في استحبابها في الثالثة والرابعة وللشافعي رحمه الله فيها قولان الجديد أنها تستحب والقديم أنها لا تستحب 
قال أصحابنا وإذا قلنا تستحب فلا خلاف أنه يستحب أن تكون أقل من من القراءة في في الأوليين قالوا وتكون القراءة في الثالثة والرابعة سواء وهل تطول الأولى على الثانية فيه وجهان أصحهما عند الجمهور أصحابنا أنها لا تطول والثاني وهو الصحيح عند المحققين أنها تطول وهو المختار للحديث الصحيح أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يطول في الأولى ما لا يطول في الثانية وفائدته أن يدرك المتأخر الركعة الأولى والله تعالى أعلم وقال الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى وإذا أدرك المسبوق مع الإمام الركعتين الأخريين من الظهر أو غيره أو غيره أو غيرها ثم قام إلى الإتيان بما بقي استحب له أن يقرأ السورة قال جماهير من أصحابنا هذا على القولين وقال بعض ماذا على قول يقرأ السورة في الأخريين وما على الآخرين فلا فلا والصواب فلا والصواب الاول لان لا تخلو صلاته من سوره والله تعالى اعلم هذا حكم الامام المنفرد هذا هذا حكم الامام والمنفرد واما الماموم فان كانت الصلاه سريه وجبت عليه الفاتحه واستحب له السوره وان كانت جهريه فان كان يسمع قراءه الامام كره له قراءة السورة وفي وجوب الفاتحة قولان أصحهما تجب والثاني لا تجب وإن كان لا يسمع القراءة فالصحيح وجوب الفاتحة واستحباب السورة وقيل لا تجب الفاتحة وقيل تجب ولا تستحب السورة والله تعالى أعلم وتجب قراءة الفاتحة في التكبيرة الأولى من صلاة الجنازة أما قراءة الفاتحة في صلاة النافلة فلا بد منها واختلف أصحابنا في تسميتها فيها فقال القفال تسمى واجبة وقال أصحابه القاضي حسين تسمى شرطا وقال غيرهما تسمى ركنا وهو الأظهر والله تعالى أعلم والعاجز عن الفاتحة في هذا كله يأتي ببدلها فيقرأ بقدرها من غيرها من القر من القرآن فيقرأ بقدرها من غيرها من القرآن فإن لم يحسن أتى بقدرها من الأذكار كالتسبيح والتهليل ونحوهما فإن لم يحسن شيئا وقف بقدر القراءة ثم يركع والله تعالى أعلم Section. Section. Valuable rulings related to recitation during prayer. I will summarize these rulings very briefly as they are already well documented in books of jurisprudence. So here the author is going to talk about ahkam nafisa, very beneficial rulings that are connected to reciting the Quran in the prayer. And the author says, Ubalig. Ubalig means I'm going to go severely in summarizing these points. I'm going to severely summarize it, meaning greatly. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too details in it. Why? Because it's documented, it is explained, and it is, it is spoken about in books of fiqh. Minha from those is? First, it is obligatory to recite the Quran in an obligatory prayer according to the consensus of the scholars. So here the ijma'u al-ulama, the consensus of the scholars is that anna tajibu al-qira'atu fi salat al That reciting is obligatory in the prayer. And the salah here is the salat al mafrudah The obligatory prayers, it is obligatory to recite the Quran. Bi ijma'i al ulama. This is the consensus of the scholars. Now. Imam Malik, Shafi'i, Ahmed, and the vast majority of scholars, may Allah have mercy on them all, have stated that reciting al Fatiha is obligatory in each raka'ah of prayer. Whereas Abu Hanifa and others have stated that reciting al Fatiha is never obligatory. And that recitation in the last two raka'ahs of prayer is also not obligatory. Here, the scholars, they, what do they all agree upon? They all agree. All of the fuqaha, this is ijma'ul ulama. The Quran has to be recited. But what they differed upon is what Quran is obligatory. Al Imam Malik and Shafi'i and Ahmed and the overwhelming majority of scholars they say the reciting of Surah Al Fatiha specifically is obligatory in every rak'ah. This is the madhab of Imam Malik as is spoken about in the Sharah Muqtasar Al Khalil. 
Also, the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, as Nawawi documented and spoke about it in his sharah of al-Muhaddab li Abishaq al-Shirazi, his majmu'ah. And it is also the madhab of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, as Ibn Qudama mentions in his Mughni, which is the Mukhtasar, which is the sharah of the Mukhtasar al-Khiraqi. Now that we've understood, and it's the Jumhur, the other overwhelming majority of scholars say that as well. That Surah Al-Fatiha is obligatory to be read in every single rak'ah. Abu Hanifa, on the other hand, he says, yes, the Quran is obligatory to be read, but not necessarily Surah Al-Fatiha. That you don't, you, he has to read something, because Allah says in the ayah, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ because he says, Allah says in the ayah, read what you're able to read in the Quran. So specifying Surah Al-Fatiha, no. And he also says, and it is not obligatory to read any Qira'ah at all in the two, two ending rak'ah of the prayer. Al-Marghinani in, in Kitab Al-Hidayah, he expands on that. He speaks about it in Kitab Al-Hidayah Al-Marghinani. He's a Hanafi scholar. Naam. The first is the correct opinion. So the first opinion is the strongest. What's the first opinion? Qawlu Malik wa Shafi'i wa Ahmad rahimahumullah jami'an wa jamahir al-ulama. That tata'ayyan uh, qira'at surat al-fatiha fi kulli rak'ah. That every single rak'ah, fatiha has to be read. That, to, and the evidence for that is what? Due to various proofs stated in the sunnah, that it is enough to mention. As evidence, the hadith, the authentic hadith where the Prophet says, if prayer in which a fatiha is not recited is invalid. This is the hadith narrated by Ibn Khuzayma in his Sahih and Ibn, Hab, Ibn Hibban. Ibn Hibban is the student of Ibn Khuzayma. Ibn Khuzayma is the teacher. Ibn Hibban, on the other hand, also narrated it in his Sahih as well. From who Abu Huraira, that the Prophet said, a prayer will not be rewarded or accepted. لا يقرأ فيها بإم الأم القرآن، which سورة الفاتحة is not read in it. نعم. The scholars are agreed that it is recommended to recite a surah after al-Fatiha in, in the two rak'ahs of dawn prayers, as well as the first two rak'ahs of the rest of the obligatory prayers. They disagreed, however, with regards to reciting a surah after al-Fatiha in the third and fourth rak'ahs. Imam Shafi'i has two opinions on this issue. Here, this, he says أجمعوا. Again, another consensus that is recommended. To recite a surah after Fatiha in the first two rak'ah of Subh. Salat al-Subh. Huh? Salat al-Subh is Fajr, right? You read what? You read Fatiha and then the surah after that, they all agree, there's a consensus that it's recommended to read after that. A surah. And also, the other salahs. The other salahs, the first two for them as well. For Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, all of them. But they differed upon the third and the fourth. Is it recommended? Or is it better to leave it? Do you, get the, do you, do you understand Mahal Tifaq, where they agree upon and what they differ on? They agree unanimously, all of them agree that the first two rak'ah of every prayer is recommended to what? To read a surah after Fatiha. Are you with me? But they differed whether that is the case for the third rak'ah and the fourth rak'ah. For which surahs, for which salahs, Dhuhr, Asr, even Maghrib, because Maghrib has third rak'ah, and Isha. Whether the last two, I mean the last rak'ah for the Maghrib, for instance, the third and the fourth, whether it's recommended to read a surah after Fatiha. Well, the Shafi'i, rahimahullah, fi qawlan. And Imam Shafi'i, he holds two views in this issue. First one is what? The latter of these opinions is actually recommended. One. And Imam Shafi'i has two madhabs. You know that, right? Madhab called Madhab al Jadid, which is his old, his new view. And there's a madhab which is called the Madhab. How do you know the difference between his Madhab al Jadid and Qadim? How would one know? Huh? How do you know it's in Egypt? It's who narrates it from him. If Rabi ibn Sulaiman al Muradi, or Ismail ibn Yahya al Muzani, or Yaqub al Buwaiti narrate it from him, this is his new view. 
This was in Egypt. But if Al-Hassan ibn Muhammad ibn Sadiq al-Za'farani and Abu Thawr and Ahmed ibn Hanbal transmit a view from Imam al-Shafi'i, this is the Qawl al-Qadim. They were his old students in Iraq. Haraftum? Naam. So the view that his, his new view at Imam al-Shafi'i is to tahabbu that is recommended. And his old opinion used to be annaha la tustahabbu, that is not recommended. Our companions have stated that if we assume that it is recommended, there is no difference in agreement that the third and fourth recitations should be shorter in length than the first two, and that the recitation in the third and fourth rak'ah should be equal. The Shafi'iya, like an Imam al if you go to Kitab al-Minhaj, Nawi has a Kitab al-Minhaj, right? An Imam al is Kitab al-Minhaj, he actually took an Imam al-Shafi'iya's Qawl al-Qadim, his old opinion. And these are from the Masail which Nawawi or other scholars of the Shafi'i scholars take from Shafi'i's old opinion and they make the madhab still stand on that. Al-Rafi'i does that sometimes and Nawawi does that as well. That they take his old opinion and they still make that the opinion that's going to be used within the madhab. And it's, it's not much that they do that to. The majority of the time they take his new opinion. But these are from the Masail al-Mukhtara fi al madhab that is chosen within the madhab al-Shafi'iyyah but that's the old opinion of Shafi'i, not his new opinion. There are two opinions as to whether or not it is recommended <coughs> that the recitation in the first rak'ah should be longer than the second. The majority of Shafi'i scholars are of the opinion that the recitation in the first rak'ah should not be longer than the second. The other opinion is that it is better to make the first rak'ah longer than the second. So here the issue, another issue he goes into which is وَهَلْ تُطَوَّلُ الْأُولَى عَلَى الثَّانِيَةِ فِي وَجْهَانِ Should the first rak'ah be made longer than the second? He says there's two opinions in this. أَصَحُّهُ مَا The strongest is according to the Jumur Ashabina, the majority of the Shafi'i scholars أَنَّهَا لَا تُطَوَّلْ That you don't make it longer. This second opinion is the more correct of the two as it conforms to the hadith that states that the Prophet وسلم, would prolong the first rak'ah. Shafi'i and Nawawi goes now against his own madhab. The madhab, the strongest opinion according to the madhab Shafi'iyah is that anna la tutawwal. Lakin Nawawi says la. والثاني هو الصحيح. The second is, is the strongest which is what? Anna la tutawwal. That the first rak'ah is made longer than the second rak'ah. وَهُوَ الْمُخْتَارُ This is the chosen. Naam. Based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So this shows you that the A'imma follow them the hadith, that they should follow the hadith, even if it goes against the madhab. Naam. The benefit in doing this is that it allows time for those coming to the prayer late to catch the first rak'ah and Allah knows best. He brings the evidence for it, first of all, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to lengthen in the first rak'ah مَا لَا يُطَوِّلُ فِي الثَّانِيَةِ which that, that which he never used to do in the second. Are you with me? And the benefit that he mentions, why it's better to lengthen the first rak'ah. Why is it beneficial that the first rak'ah is long? The benefit is that أَنْ يُدْرِكَ الْمُتَأَخِّرُ الْرَكْعَةِ الْأُولَى If the Imam lengthens the first rak'ah, it allows the people to catch up with the Imam and to catch up with the prayer. And he goes, وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَعْلَمَ أَنَّ اللَّهُ knows best. Naam. Imam Shafi'i states, if a person misses the first two rak'ahs of the noon prayers or any other prayer and then stands up to make them up, it is recommended that he recite a surah after al-Fatiha. Most Shafi'i scholars have stated that this is the verdict regardless of whether or not it is said that a surah should be, recite, should be read after al-Fatiha in all four rak'ahs or in the first two rak'ahs only. Mm -hmm. Others, however, have said that this ruling is based on the opinion that a surah is to be read after al fatiha in no. all four rak'ahs. No. The first of these two opinions is more correct, as in this manner the prayer will not be devoid of a surah along with al fatiha and this is better. The above rulings apply to those who lead the prayers and those praying alone. No. As for those being led in prayer, it is obligatory that they recite al fatiha during the prayers where recitation is silent, and it is recommended that they recite a surah after al-Fatiha. During prayers where the Qur'an is read aloud, however, it is disliked that one recites a surah after al-Fatiha as long as he can hear the imam. 
There are two opinions regarding whether or not it is obligatory for those being led in a prayer where the Qur'an is being recited aloud to recite Al-Fatiha. The more correct of these two opinions is that it is obligatory and that the other is that it is not, even if you cannot hear the recitation of the Imam. Thus, so he goes into the issue known as is, is Fatiha obligatory to be read when the Imam is reading the Fatiha out loud, like Maghrib and Isha and Al-Fajr. The Imam is already reading Surah Al-Fatiha. Is it a Sunnah for me to go? So, is it obligatory for me to go and read Fatiha? Huh? The strongest opinion in this issue is that it is obligatory. Every single body has to read Surah Al-Fatiha. Everyone does. The Hadith of the Prophet stands in the Hadith that we just narrated. لا يجزي الصلاة أحدكم أما لا that لا يجزي الصلاة أحدكم that one of your prayers is not accepted, لا يقرأ فيها بأم القرآن in which Surah Al-Fatiha is not read. أما لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب. There's no prayer for the one who does not read Surah Al-Fatiha. So that hadith is general and is generic and it encompasses the salat which is jahriya and the salat which is sirriya. It encompasses both. Even that though al-allam al-muhaddith the Imam of this time in Hadith, Muhammad Nasir al-Din al-Albani, alayhi rahmatullahi, may Allah bestow his never-ending mercy unto him. In his noble, great book, Sifat al-Salat al-Nabi, min al-Takbiri ila al-Taslimi ka'annaka taraha, he mentions in that book that reading Surah Al-Fatiha is a what? Is not obligatory in the prayer when it's loud. Maghrib al-Isha, and Al-Fajr, the person doesn't have to read Surah Al-Fatiha. And inshallah, if Allah gives us the chance to go through that book, we will speak about it in more details. What's the evidence is for it? What are the evidences against it? How do you reconcile between the two? And how do we counter, uh, how do we counter the argument of Sheikh Muhammad Nasir al-Din al-Albani? Thus, as mentioned, the correct opinion is that reciting Al-Fatiha is obligatory, but the recitation of a surah after Al-Fatiha is only recommended. Others have stated that reciting Al-Fatiha is not obligatory, and others still have, have held that reciting a surah after Al-Fatiha is not recommended, and Allah knows best. It is obligatory to recite Al-Fatiha after the first takbir of the funeral prayer. It is also obligatory to recite it in all supererogatory super prayers. Shafi'i scholars disagree as to the category of ruling under which the, rec the recitation of Al-Fatiha during prayers should fall. Shafi'iya, they, they differ now. They agree amongst themselves that Surah Al-Fatiha is what? It has to be read. But they differ amongst themselves. Should we call it a pillar? Should we call it a prerequisite? So should we call it a rukun? Should we call it a shart? Should we call it wajib? They differ upon what term should they coin the, the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. And the strongest Nawi chooses here is that it should be called a rukun, a pillar, because that's the correct definition of what a rukun is, a pillar. Now, Qafal stated that it should be labeled as obligatory. His companion, Judge Hussein, stated that it is seen as a condition, and others have stated that it should be regarded as a pillar. So there are three views. Wajib, Sharq, and a rukun What's the difference between the three? Wajib encompasses a Sharq and a rukun A Sharq and a rukun are both Wajib. Okay? It's both what? Both of them are Wajib. But Wajib is more generic and is bigger and more <coughs> comprehensive. Okay? It's more comprehensive in the sense where in the sense where the wajib, if you miss it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to bring back that prayer. Okay? Whereas the sharp and the rukun both share what? Both of them, if you find out that a sharp is missing from your prayer, you would have to bring back the prayer. If you realize that a rukun it was missing from your prayer, you would have to bring back your prayer. So what's the difference between a shart and a rukun then? The difference is that a shart is kharij an mahiyat al-shay. It's not part of the thing. It's before it. 
Whereas the rukun is what? Dakhilun fi mahiyat al shay. Whereas the pillar is actually in the prayer. It's while still praying. Does that make sense? So the shart is before the action, such as wudu. Wudu you have to do before the action. Whereas the rukun, you need to do it while still praying. But there are some shurut that start before the action and they also go into the prayer. So they are a shart when they are outside the prayer, but once you're in the prayer, it becomes a, a rukun, like an intention. The intention is what? It's a shart and it's also a rukun, because the intention has to still remain whilst you're praying. It can't go. So it's a shart when it's before the prayer, and it is also a rukun since it's part of the action itself. So that's the difference between all of them. Now, it would appear that the last of these categories is most appropriate and Allah knows best. Since Surah Al Fatiha doesn't happen before the prayer, can you read Fatiha before the Salah? No, you don't. You read Fatiha in the prayer, right? So it's, it's correct to call it a, 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 a rukun, which is a pillar. Now, if one is unable to recite Al Fatiha, he should recite from the Quran that which is equal in quantity to Al Fatiha. So somebody says, I can't read Fatiha. He just took Islam now. He came into Islam a couple of minutes ago, and then Salatul Dhuhr comes in. Uh, so what does he do in this situation? Nawawi rahimahullah, he says, وَالْعَاجِزُ عَنِ الْفَاتِحَةِ The one who can't learn Fatiha now because it's... Then, what does he do? يَأْتِي بِبَدَلِهَا He comes with something that can take its place. So he reads, فَيَقْرَأُ بِقَدَلِهَا مِنْ غَيْرِهَا مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ He would have to read any other part of the Qur'an that he can read that's equivalent to it. If he can. فَإِنْ لَمْ يُحْسِنْ If he can't do that, then he comes with adhkar. He says, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So we just teach him that word, say Allahu Akbar. So when you say Allahu Akbar in the prayer, you read, you read Allahu Akbar. Or you say Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Or you keep saying La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha You just keep saying that. If he can't even do that, are you with me? He doesn't even can't say La ilaha illallah, can't say anything. He doesn't know anything. Brothers, he says, I can't, what do you say? I say it again? Okay. Oh, I forgot, what was it? And he keeps forgetting it. Then he just stands. <sighs> Alhamdulillah. So he comes under the ayah, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَقَفَ بِقَدْرِ الْقِرَاءَةِ ثُمَّ يَرْقَعَ وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَالَمْ Naam. So if he's unable to do this, then he should say, أَذْقَالْ That's just subhanAllah, la ilaha illallah. Also in proportion to the amount of time it takes to read al-fatiha, if one is unable to do any of this, he should stand for a period of time equivalent to that which it would take to recite al-fatiha, and Allah is best. InshaAllah ta'ala, we'll take 15 minutes break and we'll carry on after the break, inshaAllah ta'ala.